We at CrowBio are recarbonizing soils with our supercharged microbes. Nucoco are making cocoa-free chocolate that is healthier and dramatically less impactful on the environment. At Calibri, we are playing music to cells to unlock the industrial potential of advanced therapeutics. Palette Therapeutics is developing a new approach to weight loss by temporarily modifying your taste buds to help support healthier lifestyle. At Cell Bio Engines, we are making off-the-shelf cell therapies to kill cancer. Calder produces next-generation vaccines that elicit best-in-class responses by using 3D VaxLock technology. Hi, my name is Sabria Stukes, and as Chief Scientific Officer for IndieBio New York, I am incredibly excited to welcome you to Class 6 Demo Day. If you registered as an accredited investor, you will receive a link to a portal where you can review company pitch decks and book time with any of our founders. If you're interested in applying to our program, please visit IndieBio.co. All said, sit back, and I hope you enjoy hearing what our founders have been up to. Crowbio, we are revolutionizing soil regeneration by converting CO2 into root boosting carbon. In our present climate, farmers battle soil struggles like never before. Soil health, intertwined with the climate, directly affects crop yield, impacting both farmer survival and global food security. As soil degradation surges, vital carbon diminishes, drought now devours a staggering third of farmers' precious crop yields. CroBio leads a remarkable mission to address the global challenge of improving soil water retention to ensure farmers have sustainable harvests. Through photosynthesis, plants convert atmospheric CO2 into root secreted sugars. CroBio's enhanced microbes consume these sugars and convert them to a stable biomaterial that is carbon rich and highly water retentive. As the microbes grow around the roots, and the roots expand meters deep and acres wide, the soil is regenerated at scale. And this leads to better soil water retention, which means better crop resilience to drought. It increases annual yields and soil sequestered carbon. And finally, it improves nutrient cycling, encompassing nitrogen, phosphorus, and micronutrients due to heightened biodiversity. Probio provides a system solution to a system problem. Hi there, I'm with Wayne Mohull now. Great to see you, Wayne. And you, Alex. Good to see you again. So are you in farms right now with your strains and what has the reception been like from farmers? Yeah, great. Um, so this year we're intending to put 1,500 acres into the ground mm -hmm. product. Um, we've got 1,000 acres in Latin America and 500 acres in North America. Uh, the Latin American is going to be maize mm -hmm. that we're planting and North America is going to be wheat. And I can say that the farmers that we talk to are super excited about this going into the ground. That's incredible. And obviously you're experiencing Indy by New York. How has that been? And what have you been most proud of in terms of your accomplishments? Well, I mean, we're a, a young, agile startup. So uh, we recognize from a product fit perspective that there was a market for GMO, but we also recognize there was a market for non-GMO. And we're absolutely... Uh, thrilled to be able to announce that we've developed a non-GMO version mm -hmm. just in the three months we've been in Indibio. So oh, incredible! Yeah, well, congratulations. And uh, what is this? I may ask. Uh -huh. yeah. You're looking at a will first, there, Alex. That is cellulose that has been converted from glucose into cellulose by our engineered microbes. Mm -hmm. uh, cellulose holds more than seven times its weight in water. Mm -hmm. This is the this is the biomaterial which is going to sit around the roots of plants that's going to hold all that water around the roots of plants to regenerate soil. It will break back down into sugars, which is what the farmers are really excited about. Okay. So not only are we sequestering carbon, mm -hmm. we're holding water around the roots and we're actually putting sugars up to six feet, eight feet deep into the soil. Wow, that's incredible. And in terms of the risks ahead for CroBio or the challenges, what do you foresee and how are you going to succumb those? Yeah, uh, farmer uptake uh, in the US 
for biostimulants still looks around about the 23, 26 percent. Mm -hmm. We would really like to be part of the paradigm shift, which moves farmers from chemicals mm -hmm. into biologicals. And we think we can lead the charge on this. Once we get the results from our field trials, there's no holding us back. Amazing. OK, well, you have a captive audience. Any last words you want to say to the investors in the audience as to why you're a great opportunity? Um, we have the only product in the world, effectively, which is microbial, which holds water in the soil. Mm -hmm. Nobody else is doing this. We can fight drought, we can sequester carbon, mm -hmm. and we can bulk regenerate soils for future generations. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Wayne. Thanks, Alex. RSV vaccines elicit antibodies that recognize the shape of fusion proteins. Once bound, they physically block the virus from attaching. To avoid this, the virus will frequently change the shape of its surface proteins to avoid the antibodies. So something vital is required to lock this protein into shape. At Calder, we can do just that using our 3D Vaxlock technology. Let's imagine this twisted up rubber band is a protein. In this correct shape, it would elicit antibodies that bind and neutralize the virus when it shows up. But if you let it unravel, it'll elicit antibodies that can't recognize the virus and that won't protect. At Calder, we put molecular staples into proteins. We form crosslinks between tyrosine side chains engineered to be in close structural proximity to each other, these carbon-carbon bonds are irreversible and lock the protein in its most potent 3D shape. Our vaccines then not only hold their correct shape longer on the shelf, but also after they're injected into someone's arm. Responses to our vaccines are amplified at least tenfold, meaning that vulnerable people will mount far more protective responses to smaller and safer doses. These responses are focused on neutralizing epitopes that have prolonged in vivo exposure and elicit much better neutralizing antibody responses. This enhances vaccines' safety and efficacy and lowers their risk and cost of development. Simultaneously, we lower their cost of goods and reduce their need for cold chain storage. The stability of a vaccine is key, and Calder has the 3D Vax Lock to secure it. Okay, I'm joined uh, here with Chris Marshall, CEO of Calder Bioscience. Chris, first question, what is RSV? Ah, RSV is a respiratory virus, like the name says, it's the respiratory syncytial virus. Um, and it's particularly infective, so it, it it, it gets everyone by the time they're two. But the only people who really develop problems with it are the super young and the super old. Super young people will develop sensitized lungs that they'll, they'll suffer with throughout life, and the super old will develop pneumonia, be hospitalized, and sometimes even die. Okay, um, so there are RSV vaccines already out there uh, that have been approved. Like what, you know, so why, why are you coming along with another RSV? Right. Thanks. So the, the first set of vaccines have come through um, and they've, they've done a, a great job, but we've, we've been able to see now that there are limits to what they can do. And because our technology allows us to improve the performance of the vaccine, we can come in with a bio better and actually solve problems that haven't been solved yet. Great, okay. So how are you differentiated from these other RSV vaccines and, and your whole strategy that you have? Right, so the proof of principle was achieved by the NIH with what is called disulfide bonds. And these are bonds that are formed between you know, two methionine side chains or whatever. But when we come in, we, we do dityrosine bonds. And they're much more easy to, they're, they're much more easily placed. So we can put them where we need them the most in the molecule. And then the dityrosine bond itself is a carbon-carbon bond, so it's really stable. So it really locks in the shape that we need the most. Okay. So Calder Bioscience have made a huge amount of progress uh, in their journey. Like you're on the cusp of going into the clinic now. Um, okay. 
I, you've done this with a number of different partners. Yes. Can you give us some kind of um, kind of scope of the type of partnerships that you have that are delivering this? Sure, sure. Um, we started with funding from the Gates Foundation, and then we collaborated with the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. And then as we moved through and got into, into RSV and, and flu and all that stuff, um, we started working with, you know, a bunch of academic uh, places that we worked with the University of Pittsburgh very intensively with the University with Vanderbilt, um, and specifically with the NIH. We got funding from the NIH, we got funding from the state of New York, from ESD, um, and, uh, and you know, of course, now we've been with, with IndieBio. Okay, so how specifically have IndieBio been able to help cultivate bioscience on their journey? IndieBio was instrumental in teaching us how to communicate and really just get, you know, our message across to people in the language that they need to understand. So when we're talking to investors, we need to speak the language that investors speak, and, you know, IndieBio is really been just unbelievable in teaching us how to do this. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Currently, the gold standard of growing cells is in a suspension by a reactor that uses large blades, which if you think about it, creates a much more chaotic environment than they're used to in your body. At Calibri, we use acoustic waves to manipulate the cells in space with low shear, providing them with an optimal environment much closer to the environment found in our bodies. You can think of it as playing music to cells. We use an acoustic element or a speaker to generate a standing wave that will gently hold the cells within the acoustic field that we have designed. Cells can expand in high density or be engineered within individual layers in suspension. And because we control the acoustic field in real time, we can increase the frequency or turn the volume up and break the cells open to harvest the production when the time is right therefore removing the need for chemical detergents in the process. Using our acoustic based bioreactor, or as I like to call them, our music boxes to grow cells, we allow for an increase in yield and a decrease in production cost up to 50 times. That means then that with our solution, we have the opportunity to unlock even more therapies and increase both the industry's market size and the number of people who have access to these treatments. By using sound, I firmly believe that Calibri has the potential to heal the world. Hi, I'm here with Emily, CEO and co-founder of Calibri Lab. Hi, Emily. Hi, Sabria. I have always been so impressed by how you describe your technology as music boxes to grow cells. I feel like the average person doesn't understand how uh, drugs are discovered and or made, especially in the cell and gene therapy industry. So can you share even more about how your technology will help decrease cost uh, for these critical solutions? For sure. Maybe just to start, what you need to understand is that cell and gene therapies rely on cells, so human cells, that will be used as the therapeutic instead of a chemical drug, for example. And for them, for the field to be able to move forward, you need to be able to grow a large number of cells. So scalability is key. And right now, the current manufacturing methods are not scalable en enough. And we have this completely groundbreaking approach of using ultrasound so sound, to be able to control in real time the environment of the cells, and that increases yield 10 times and decreased production cost. So what that means for the field is that we get more therapies accessed by patients, because we're talking about treatments that cost over $3 million per patient to produce sometimes. And also we get to unlock some clinical trials and move forward, because right now they are being stuck because of manufacturing inefficiencies. Yeah, and you are one of the few companies that can say, or a few companies in the SOSV portfolio that can say you've gone through both Hacks and IndieBio New York. So can you talk to us uh, about that experience? Yes, absolutely. So we are a Hacksy Bio venture. Love it. Yeah. 
We started with Hacks um, two years ago when we were only Gabriel and I and an idea, a piece of paper and his PhD, and Duncan decided to uh, hop on board at the venture. So that was really helpful, although like back then it was still COVID and remote, so we did the program remote. And it was really helpful to uh, get us through the fundraising process, also understanding the ways that US-based VC firms work as opposed to Euro European firms. Now, about IndieBio, it was definitely helpful as well, but very, very helpful because we're a biotech company. So I think for us, it was valuable to help us understand how to best package our data sets, what our investors looking for when looking at a biotech company, so, and also how to tell the story of a biotech that is compelling enough, especially in such a climate environment. Absolutely. And, you know, you're talking about, you know, investors getting excited about early stage biotech companies, and there's only so much that they can go on, right? Is it a big enough problem? Does the solution work? And then is this the team that is going to actually do the thing they say they're going to do? So obviously the team is so important. And so can you tell us a little bit more about uh, how you met Gabrielle and, you know, kind of why you make such a strong team today? Yeah. So we met in 2020 in that program that's for Entrepreneur First. So kind of matchmaking of tech and business entrepreneurs. And back then, Gabrielle told me, hey, I know how to make sales, levitate using acoustic waves. I think there is value in the industry and um, I don't really know. I'm looking for a CEO. And I decided to hop on board as well because I trusted my guts. We share the same values. We share the same vision for a company that we wanted to build as well as a mission. So both of us were really driven by health, uh, the health industry. And we uh, decided to team up three years ago now. And now he has a very unique expertise. Uh, there's like 50 people in the world that understand the physics behind acoustic cell manipulation. So he made a lot of sense to investors. Now, I did not make a lot of sense to investors back then because they were like, who's that girl? Uh, she's smart, but she's the right person. I think I built my resilience and my credibility over time because I have now become an expert of the field of cell engine therapies and I've shown a lot of resilience. And coming from that engineering background as well really helped me understand the physics behind what we were building. But I also have this business background that really helps me understand how we create value. And on top of things, I was a professional pianist. So that <laughs> is the funny story. Yeah, fantastic, Emily. Can't wait to see what you guys keep doing. Thank you. Sugar consumption has witnessed an alarming surge over the past two centuries. Today, a 12-ounce can of soda contains more sugar than what was consumed in an entire five-day period back in 1800. This excessive sugar addition is not limited to desserts and soda, but extends to unexpected products like peanut butter and salad dressing, enticing us further. Despite the consistent recommendations from doctors and health experts to reduce intake, it remains a challenge due to our food culture and inherent biological cravings. Understanding how we taste sugar with its interaction on our tongue and taste bud cells reveals the complex nature of our relationship with it. The taste of sugar triggers a dopamine response in our brain, urging us to consume more. Unfortunately, modern food exploits this process, intensifying our desire and making long-term sugar restriction seem nearly impossible. But now, a new era is dawning. At Palette, we are at the forefront of developing a revolutionary therapy capable of temporarily altering the taste of sweet foods. Leveraging our expertise in drug delivery, we have engineered an orally disintegrating film akin to a Listerine strip that is applied to the tongue. This innovative film enables targeted delivery of nucleic acids to taste buds, granting us the power to modify specific sweet signaling pathways. However, our mission goes far beyond altering mere molecular markers. We strive to empower true habit change and facilitate a holistic transformation of health. Our therapy is designed to produce a comprehensive shift 
enabling individuals to break free from the grip of sugar addiction. We're Palette Therapeutics, and together we can embark on a journey towards a healthier, happier future. Hi, I'm here with CEO and co-founder David Francis of Palette Therapeutics. David, can you share a little bit more about how you plan to differentiate yourself from some of the other weight loss options that are currently on the market? Yeah, of course. So some of the really popular drugs right now for weight loss, Ozempic and Wagovi, the way that these drugs more or less work is that they suppress your appetite for every food. Mm -hmm. And this is somewhat effective, it leads to weight loss, but there's some challenges with these drugs. So you have to take them for life, and as soon as you stop taking them, the weight comes back on. The reason for this is that these foods do nothing to affect people's food preference. They just suppress your appetite and make being hungry more bearable. So what we wanna do is come in with a much more controllable and targetable approach by going after sweet foods, which really dominate junk foods today. And can we make these foods less appealing to help people change habits and make long-term changes. And what are users saying to you when you're telling them about the potential of this technology? Yeah, people really want options. Weight loss is the most common New Year's resolution. 45 million Americans try to lose weight every year, but many drugs don't really work. There's a lot of snake oils and supplements out there, but when you look at the problem, it really comes down to sugar and how much we consume of it now. So can we address this without changing people's taste for other foods? We don't wanna just make all food not taste good, like what some of these other options do. It wants to be much more controllable. And I'm sure you're seeing a lot of excitement from investors, and so on your end, what would the ideal investor for Palette Therapeutics look like? Yeah, I think we're looking for an investor who is interested in moonshot ideas. So we're an early stage therapeutics company, long ways to go, science takes time, but we're moving quickly on the science front. And so having an investor who enjoys the science and wants to see that journey progress is really interesting to us. But I think coupled with that, an investor who sees our vision, we're not just trying to develop a new therapeutic that kind of moves the needle a little bit. This is truly paradigm altering in the sense of, we're not trying to modulate a pathway after the problems occurred. This is a preventative approach. Fantastic, thanks David. We are incredibly fortunate to be living in a time where we can use the words cancer and cure in the same sentence. Today, there are two common cell transplantation approaches. In autologous cell therapy, the patient's cells are extracted, genetically modified and re-injected. The issue is, the cells come from patients that are sick, so these are sick cells. Also. The process is one patient, one batch, with high variability across patients. The second much better option is allergenic cell therapy. This treatment offers advantages like starting with a high quality raw material that has the ability to standardize the product, decrease time to treatment, and also decrease production cost. At Cell BioEngines, we make these allergenic cells off the shelf and at a scale never seen before. We do this by harnessing the incredible potential of healthy umbilical cord derived stem cells as our unique starting raw material. We've developed a way of expanding these stem cells exponentially so that they can be used as a replacement tissue in blood and bone marrow transplantation. Additionally, we can differentiate these same cells to create a broader arsenal of rare new immune cell states. The human body is made of trillions of cells which reside in a vast landscape of possible states. As opposed to other companies out there that are making heterogeneous cell types, our stem space platform focuses only on selecting and manufacturing cell states 
that are highly potent against cancer. Not only do our cells come from healthy donors, but we can also dose multiple patients across multiple tumor targets from just one ounce of umbilical cord blood. I'm joined by AJ, uh, CEO of Cell Bio Engines. So, first question, AJ, tell me how, how did Cell Bio Engines come about? Tell me that story. So, the company idea was largely conceived during my PhD studies uh, when I bumped into Professor Nina Bartowicz from Tisch Cancer Center uh, at Mount Sinai and Parker Institute. Um, and her technology of scalable manufacturing and making immune cell types blew my mind. And that's when we decided we're going to partner and we license the technology from Mount Sinai. Oh, good move. Great move. Okay. So, like the indication you're going after, you're going after oncology, cancer. Um, you know, if you paid any attention to like popular press, you might think, oh, cancer, it's cured. Like it's, you know, we can. So, you know, why are you going into that particular area? So when you say cancer is cured, we talk about the efficacy of using immune cells in blood cancers, and we do see a 70% efficacy and response rate there. However, the new class of medicine, cell gene therapies, has not been able to penetrate solid cancer. And 90% of cancer of our body is solid, and that's where are uh, assets like dendritic cells and NK cells with specific subclass we're using to target solid cancer there. Great, great. Um, like you've made a tremendous amount of progress. Um, you're actually in the clinic. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, tell me a bit about, you know, that process, how that happens and yep. like the, like, where you, you're seeing the future of cell yep. engines. So while we were developing these assets for solid cancers, uh, we, we were approached by Mount Sinai with another technology that was using the same cell source, uh, which is umbilical cord blood stem cells in our case. And um, that technology is expanding the stem cells while retaining the stemness. So it fits in perfect for bone marrow transplantation cases for hematological disorders. And, and uh, we recently completed the in licensing of that technology too. So uh, now we are both uh, in the market for solid and hematological cancer. Great, great work. Um, okay, so how is IndiBio, you know, the program, how's that been able to help cell bio engines? I think Indie Bio provided as a platform uh, to start navigating the company building in a way where we could leverage all the business partnerships, our customer discovery effort, and the financial momentum that we built after we were endorsed by uh, something as reputable as SOSV has added uh, a lot to our uh, our, our reputation and credibility to go before investors and say, hey, we've got, we've got drugs out there in the pipeline and, and um, now we have the traction too. That's great to hear. Yeah. I'm very pleased for you. Thank you very much, Steve. Climate Tech Company and we're on a mission to save chocolate. So we make a cocoa-free chocolate and that means that rather than using precious cocoa beans we use a more robust father bean that we can source right here in the UK. And the reason we're doing this is that the cocoa supply chain is hugely damaging to human and planetary health and also climate change is drastically affecting the ability of cocoa farmers to supply the market with cocoa. This year alone, there's a deficit of 155,000 tonnes. That equates to 355 million pounds worth of chocolate bars. And the, the climate modelling shows that in 10 years, this is going to grow to 50 billion pounds worth of chocolate bars. We love chocolate. We've worked with it for the last 15 years. 
This product is ultimately for everyone who loves chocolate and wants to secure its future against climate change. At Nucoco, we copy a traditional cocoa fermentation process, but instead of using cocoa beans, specifically we use local beans, and then we apply our technology, which combines a unique biotransformation, controlled fermentation and drying, which unlocks these, these key flavour analogues, which give it this wonderful chocolatey taste. So Nucoco is not just a great copy of chocolate. We want to evolve the conversation around the product to something we like to call chocolate 2.0. That's the same great taste of chocolate, but with less sugar, better nutrition and increased functionality. So as cocoa supply goes down, cocoa prices go up. And what we offer to the market as a cocoa-free chocolate is a price-stable, long-term alternative to the market. Here in Europe, we're using a father bean because they're abundant, they're cost-effective and really beneficial to the soil. But as we grow into Asia, for example, we'll use a domestic bean. That makes our technology truly flexible and scalable. For consumers, what do they care about? They care about the snap of it, the shine, and that lovely mouthful. And Rucoco delivers on all those fronts. So for manufacturers, they care about the tempering cycle. How can it fit into their manufacturing process? And the really compelling thing for consumers is when we tell them we're still chocolate bean to bar makers, we're just using different beans. That's a really cool concept that they're really getting into. Nikoko is on a mission not just to replicate chocolate, but to make it better. Better for us and better for our planet. Okay, I'm now joined by Ross Newton here in Seven Pen Plaza. Great to see you, Ross. I see you too. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think the question that a lot of people might have here today is when can we taste this and how do we get our hands on it? Well, well the good news is that you can try it right now. So we've got, actually, we just launched our first consumer product. Exactly. It's a prototype. We've got it on the, on the website. Sold out, actually, in, in about four hours. So uh, you can go online and buy it. And also, we do have some samples here, so uh, for lucky people that can try a little bit later. Incredible. And so, tell us a little bit about your history in chocolate and why you're passionate about the industry. Yeah, so myself and the other co-founders, we've been working in chocolate for nearly 10 years. We actually had a previous chocolate brand that we started up in the UK. It's more of a kind of traditional, uh, um, kind of uh, premiumization kind of chocolate brand. Mm -hmm. And that was super popular. We exited it about uh, a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so this we kind of span off uh, from, from that, basically. Okay, amazing. So you're a real life Willy Wonka, just need the purple coat and yeah. you're good. <laughs> uh, and so I suppose the, the question that I have, uh, you know, this is a new product. No one's kind of like seen it before. Mm -hmm. What maybe can your chocolate do that traditional chocolate cannot do right now? Yeah, so I suppose the, the key thing is that we're making with faba beans and not cocoa beans. So um, faba beans are a really nutritious re uh, plant. Mm -hmm. So they're high in protein. So this product here, it's, it's a high protein product. And also the, the new cocoa powder, which is the replace of a cocoa powder that we create, is, is, is a lot less bitter mm -hmm. than, than um, cocoa powder. So that means you don't have to put so much sugar in it. Mm -hmm. So naturally we have like 40, 50% less sugar in the products that we can create from uh, our new cocoa. Amazing. And I guess the question that some people might have as well is the concerns that this is taken away from the livelihood of cocoa farmers. Could you just tell us a little bit about the, you know, how you're overcoming that? Uh, the, the most important thing is that the, the, what's taking away from cocoa farmers' livelihoods is climate change, mm -hmm. and it's happening right now. So this year uh, alone, climate change has caused a, a supply deficit of 155,000 tons. That's cocoa farms that can't make cocoa because of the changing climatic conditions. So, mm -hmm. and that's gonna get just worse and worse over the next 10 years. So we're not taking away kind of cocoa farmers' livelihoods. Right. We're actually just coming in to replace the, the mass market chocolate that doesn't exist on the market. Well, the, you know, you're filling that gap in the market. Yeah, yeah, abso absolutely, yeah. Okay. And uh, so, you know, you have a captive audience here right now with yep. investors. Briefly, could you explain why Nococo is a great opportunity for them? Yeah, I suppose that, that we're a super experienced team. You know, we've been doing this for a, a long time. You know, we know the chocolate market, we know the food market particularly. And, you know, we see firsthand not the, the importance of what we do, but also the market demand. There's a, you know, there's a groundswell of interest and demand, you know, not only from kind of big manufacturers down to mid-level manufacturers, all the kind of cooler kind of challenger brands that you see that, you know, they're super interested in what we're doing. So the demand's there. The team's there, uh, so you know it's just the, getting the funding in place to get us to that next stage, mm -hmm. which is why we're here today, and also also to to try our products, which is the most important thing. Amazing, exciting times! Thank you so much for your time, Ross. Thank you. And that's it. 
A huge thank you to all of our founders and the staff at SOSV and IndieBio New York for pulling this all together. As I said earlier, if you're an investor interested in supporting our companies, you'll receive information on how to do just that. And if you're an early stage founder who's interested in applying to our program, please feel free to visit our website, indiebio.co. I did my PhD at a time when sort of like AIDS was still a very big issue and there weren't any really good labs at the time that were working in virology, but there was a lab that was doing molecular oncology coming out of retroviruses. And when that opportunity opened up, that just felt incredibly natural to me. We had a chocolate business and we had it for like 10 years. Everything was fantastic. But it turns out everything wasn't fantastic. You, you go into a supermarket, every product you see is it's in a bag, it's in a box, and there's kind of ingredients in it. And all those ingredients are from different places around the world. We're kind of sitting there saying, okay, how could we change it? And then you kind of start thinking, well, where, what if you can get the chocolate from here? And obviously there's no domestic homegrown chocolate market because you can only grow cocoa beans in South America, West Africa. So you can only do that. But then you start saying, well, what if we can? During the COVID-19 pandemic, one of the more peculiar side effects of the disease was the loss of taste and or smell. There was a lot of research that was interested in finding ways to help patients regain these senses, but we had an idea of leveraging this approach to help people change their food preferences and habits altogether. Coupled with my interest in metabolism and nutrition, along with the ubiquity of processed foods that make eating healthy nearly impossible. We wanted to bring this way of thinking to a commercial product and ultimately help people reach their dietary goals. Cell and gene therapies are game changers, but we still do not know how to produce these treatments at scale. And among the 2000 clinical trials right now, 30% of them are being terminated, not because of efficacy, but because of biomanufacturing limits. In other words, we can have the best cure for cancer or Parkinson in our hands, but if it costs over a million to manufacture, it's never going to make its way to patients, the people who need it most. I started my college as a doctor with the dream of using regenerative technology to improve the world. During my postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard and MIT, I pivoted from tissue engineering to applying immunology knowledge into solutions for next generation cancer therapeutics. And now with a business background in also like stem cell biobanking industry, I'm very passionate about developing off the shelf living cellular medicines and utilizing umbilical cord as a, a source raw material. My journey began in the oil and gas industry, working for companies that had significant carbon footprints and emitted large amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere. Today, I take immense pride in the company I've built alongside my son, Ross. Together, we've developed groundbreaking technology that enables us to actively recarbonize our soils, effectively removing hundreds of millions of tons of CO2 from the atmosphere and sequestering it into the ground. And I'm determined to make a positive impact on our environment, fostering a sustainable future for generations to come including my grandchildren. children.